Rock. The Rock Pile Report. The pettiest, hardest drinking Bills podcast. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Rock Pile Report podcast. I'm your host, Bill, season ticket holder, Drew Gear. That's my producer, Chris Krueger, and we are here with your Week 7 preview, talking about the Tennessee Titans visiting the Buffalo Bills. Guys, time, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard, the place, Ralph Wilson Stadium in Orchard Park, New York. The weather, Chris, and I can't stress this enough, the weather. This might be the last quality, like really quality fall weather football game for the Buffalo Bills in 2024. Am I being hyperbolic when I say that? I haven't seen the weather report. It's going to be sunny and 66 degrees. Figure it's we're nearing the end of October. I don't think it gets better than that from here, does it? Like once you hit Halloween, it's pretty much all downhill from there, right? I mean, for me, I'm pro winter, so I prefer all the winter weather. Fall second in my uh, rating system for weather. So game's going to be awesome if if that's the weather report. Obviously, it makes for great tailgating weather, right? Yes. Not too hot that you're sweaty, but then, you know, you'd bring a light jacket. Chris, where is the uh, Rock Power Report tailgate this week? 4180 Abbott Road. The uh, good old-fashioned dock slot. Guys, if you're going to be coming and joining us, you need a parking spot, make sure you message us. Reach out to us on Twitter at Rock Power Report or shoot us an email, rockpowerreport 716 at gmail.com. Let us know how many spaces you need because I need to get that number into our guy soon. Um what else, Chris? We're going to be doing. Uh, going to have a lot of people to tailgate this week. A lot of out of towners are coming in for this. Nick is bringing his family, which is just a like like it's a case study in and of its own, like in and of itself, right? Yes. Like the fact that his daughters are allowed to listen to this podcast, and that one of them might be meaner than me, like legitimately meaner than me. As long as we're grooming them to vote correctly. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> what I like about this is that I want to see where like they both are in like 10 years. Like n- not just where they are, but how many of their potential boyfriends have they assaulted by now? By, by that point, right? Like how many boys have they roughed up in school? That's what I that's what I want to know. That's that's where my head's at when I think about this. And I'm all for it. Nick, I'm all for it. You're doing a you're you're doing a phenomenal job. Uh, Jake's going to be there. I owe Jake some uh, Springbok that I've been hanging on to for him. All right. Uh, it, it's going to be a good time. Uh, Eric Smeal probably going to be there. I think. In fact, he's coming and he's sitting with us. <laughs> My God, Eric, you are in for a real treat <laughs> sitting next to Drew Gear, especially <laughs> after those last two games. Ah, uh, guys. Guys, this is going to be easy, right? This should be a nice, easy, simple afternoon. It's the Tennessee Titans and the Bills enter the week as an eight and a half point favorite. I don't have this verified, but I have to believe that that makes us one of the largest favorites of the entire week. Wouldn't it, Chris? Yes. And then also, if you guys are watching the game at home, I think it, I think, you know what? I don't even know. It's Andrew Catalan, and I don't know who the analyst is that gets paired with Andrew Catalan. But if you watch enough Bills preseason games, you know that Andrew Catalan does their preseason games. So I thought we were going to get like somebody like Tom McCarthy to call the game because we got to play uh, fucking mayonnaise this <laughs> oh week my God, so we listen. get a shitty announced team. Yeah, I mean, on its face, does it, on its face, this does not have the makings of a competitive football game. A little bit of that has to do with the injury report for each team. Talking about injuries to watch over the course of the week. Running back James Cook with a toe injury who tried to practice last week at like the la- at the eleventh hour and ended up being a a scratch for the night, which gave way to the Ray Davis show. Uh, Tiki Barber and Devin McCourty are the analysts. Oh God! That work with uh, Catalan. Okay, I just gave it a goog. Defensive tackle Ed Oliver with a hamstring. For Tennessee, safety Jamal Adams has been put on the reserve NFI list. For those of you that don't know what that means, it is the non-football injury list, which seems like, isn't Jamal Adams old as hell? I didn't even know that he was still in the league. I was about to say the same thing. Like I, he's, he's stopped being a relevant NFL football player, which is hilarious to me. Like, has anybody ever, 
when you think about the haul that the Jets got for trading him away, you know, people talk about the Sean Watson trade being you know, this week. There's a lot of discourse about that being one of the dumbest trades in NFL history. I could also make a case for the Jamal Adams trade, because if you want to go ahead and give it a Google, what was the full compensation for the Jamal Adams trade? Also, running back Taji Spears, he is hit with a hamstring injury week to week. Ah, he's probably going to come into this contest as doubtful, which is a blow to the Tennessee Titans offense that's just looking for something. Like at this point, <laughs> Chris, have you ever had that thing where you're falling and you just start reaching out for literally anything to hold yourself up on so you don't bust your ass? Yeah, yeah. That's the Tennessee Titans offense right now. What do we have here? Seattle Seahawks traded two first round picks, a third round pick and a player for Jamal Adams. I want to know who the picks were. Does this article tell you? Allegedly, because it's revisiting the the trade. So I'm sure it's buried at the end, like all this clickbait nonsense. Maybe it is Sports Illustrated. Yeah. It's a shame what the hell they did to that thing. I remember Sports Illustrated being one of those magazines that I couldn't wait for it to show up. And I would always like flip, like there was a couple columns I was always looking forward to. Like it didn't matter what the feature pieces were. There was a couple really great columns every single week. So they got Elijah Vera Tucker and Garrett Wilson <laughs> with those picks that they got for Jamal Adams. Yes. Awesome. But yeah, Sports Illustrated used to be a magazine where you just like, like Chris, did you ever have a subscription to it? No, I don't read. Don't or can't? Both. <laughs> you know, there was, there was a uh, a uh, podcast series that came out this summer with uh, comedian Gary Veter. Mm -hmm. His dad is a con artist. Awesome. Yes. So when Gary mm. was like uh 10 or 11 because they're from new york city his dad would sit, tell people that he was a photographer with si and that his son wrote for si kids because remember they had si yeah. kids so they would get into events for like free because his dad would con them and he would he was like 13 interviewing michael jordan mark messier wayne gretzky <sighs> going to all the high level events that were at uh msg and that was that was the ruse he was i oh i write for si kids <laughs> the fuck you do that's hilarious <laughs> so when you talk about games like this it's always funny because i question like what the hell do we have in common with this team do we are there any, like the, when it comes not just in a podcast but also how much do i care about this game a lot of it gets tied up in history and our history with the Titans, you know, the formerly the Houston Oilers. Like, I almost feel like the Oilers, obviously the comeback, there's history there. But then beyond that, what have the Bills Titans matchups been like in, in your mind? If I bring up the Tennessee Titans, what's the first image that pops up in your head? Three things. <clears throat> okay. One. Greatest comeback ever. Two, Music City Miracle. Yes. And then three, that time we beat them like 14 to 10 in like Josh's rookie year. And friend of the show, Greg Trelone, had a, a video, uh, his video on YouTube kind of blow up amongst his channel and what he regularly gets in views. And then he went back after the game and replied to everyone that commented on his YouTube channel <laughs> and just rubbed it in. Cause Greg Terlone, just like us fucking petty. I remember that post game. I, that, that was the week I fell off the podium and permanently chipped my elbow when we were still doing post game press conferences is a bit. Yeah. It's funny when you look at what's happened between the Bills and Titans, because we go back and forth. There's seasons, like if you just look at recent history, there are seasons where they're this physically imposing team you know, that, that can run the ball and they can do that. I mean, I mean, Chris, until we beat them, right? Like there was a, when they first became like when they switched from being the Oilers to the Tennessee Titans in 2000. Okay. 
we were like one. I'm looking at the record right now. One and one, two, three, four, five, six. We, at one point, we had six consecutive losses to them over like a seven year span. <laughs> we we ultimately were one and seven against them between 2000 and 2015. And then in 2015, we beat them. Then we beat them again. There was the 2019 game, the 14 seven game that you're referencing for Greg. And then, you know, we absolutely just like got pummeled by them. And then we lost to them again before blowing them out at home. It's like these games were, I hate it because they're close. And yet when I think of the Titans, I don't think of any of these games. Like they don't stick to me. You know, it's not like I go into that going, oh man, they really embarrassed us that one night on prime time. Like I'd love to rub it in their face. You know, what jumps into my head is Bud Adams. Shooting Bills fans, the double middles. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Just outside of his box, shooting Bills fans, the double guns as they I, I did that. I want to say Marshawn Lynch was still on the team for that. So it was like in that phase of the drought. And then he took out a full page ad in the paper to apologize. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I would have respected it more if he never said sorry. Wouldn't you? Yeah. I don't need your apologies. Would. Chris, if you gave someone the bird while you were driving out of frustration, you I, could turn around and you could explain that away by saying, look, it was a moment of frustration and I'm just I was frazzled and I, I rather than scream profanity because I knew you wouldn't hear, hear it. I just like I reacted physically to your thing and you could buy that. Be like, OK, it was just a thing when you go double middles. That's a power move. Like that is a like you, that wasn't spur of the moment. That's how you feel. <laughs> I think that's how cancel culture got started. Was that moment? <laughs> Bud Adams, victim of cancel culture. Yeah, and then and then uh, nobody canceled him. God canceled him. God canceled. <laughs> awesome. Uh, like those are the things I think about, and we're so far. Like I also remember a game. Bills Titans. What was the year, Chris? That um, what was the year that, that I remember there being like a Vince Young game against us where he could just do no wrong. It, he embarrassed us. It, it was one of the like I remember listening to part of it on the radio and just being like, "Good God, what it, what is happening here?" When was he drafted, Vince Young? Let's what? see. When was the the uh, Rose Bowl game? Well, or is it? Or is it when? Uh, well, he was playing for them in two thousand six, according to this right here. All right, so then it might have been like a 07, 06 game. I think it's that game right there, or maybe the, the the maybe the one afterwards. I thought he started as a rook. Yeah, yeah, Vince Young, Bobby Wade, and Rob, so- Rob My Baronis with the game winner. <laughs> So realistically, it's hard to generate animosity for the team involved in this, especially now, because, you know, tonight we're going to give you a walkthrough and help you get familiar with the 2024 iteration of the Tennessee Titans, which if you thought they were down bad before, holy shit, strap in, ladies and gentlemen. But I will say, you know what? It's not hard to generate animosity for Chris is a city and a place. Tennessee sucks. Okay, like I love that this game for the Bills is falling on the same weekend Tennessee and Alabama play each other. There's a clip out there of a guy just slandering literally everything about Tennessee. He's like, their women suck. Every, <laughs> their women aren't pretty. Their food sucks. The air smells bad. <laughs> and everything about bad, bad about Tennessee. But he's not wrong. Like Chris, what has besides whiskey? What does Tennessee do that's worth a shit? Hawk Tua. Yeah, I was going to say, look, you 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 allowed this to be a thing, right? Like everyone talks about Nashville and what a great place it is. But for every awesome story I hear about Nashville, there's 500 of these things where it's just women who are intoxicated, guys who are intoxicated and YouTubers just walking around asking inane questions. Like imagine being that like Hawk Tua. Good for her, I guess. Like I think her her rise to fame is just another sign of just American stupidity. Yeah, yeah. Like we're circling the drain here intellectually, people. But imagine the family. 
Like Chris, imagine like, imagine that's your girlfriend. You're trying to date her. And all of a sudden you open your phone and you're getting text messages. And oh man, did you see this from 500 people? And it's your girlfriend saying gross things on the internet. And you're like, oh no. Oh, here, I thought we were like building something. And instead you're just gross. You're you're gross for strangers. Ugh. <laughs> Nashville. Nashville provided the backdrop for that whole fiasco. That is somehow still, to my horror, unfolding before our eyes. Also, their barbecue sucks. I'll say it. Tennessee barbecue stinks. I don't want to hear anything about it. You know, The same way I don't like Kansas City, like Kansas City style sauce, Q42 makes one. My barbecue company makes a KC style rub. We have a Kansas City sauce that people love. Our, But Chris, how, how funny is it? A New York State Kansas City rub was 14th in the fucking country it's from new york oh it's the style no everything you, you know what kansas city style is they want like molassesy, overly sweet to feed their giant obese population tennessee they just take it and they're like no man we just like dry rubs oh because you suck at making sauce you want things dry and you want your ribs falling off the bone kiss my ass i was gonna ask you what's the what is a tennessee barbecue it's just dry rub they, they focus on a lot on dry rubs it's it's a lot of ten, tennessee barbecue it's more dry rubs over sauce so they like drier meats i don't know it's they, it can kick rocks as far as i'm concerned all of it so between hawk to that i mean i get of course kid rock has a bar now kid rock has a bar in nashville it's didn't fitting. know that is it well, what's funny is kid rock like one of the like tennessee you live in a place where kid rock built a white house replica on his property it's a smart move it sounds like one of the dumbest places on earth doesn't it yes <laughs> and yet somehow as dumb as that sounds the 2024 tennessee titans are even dumber now I want, to st- I want to break this up into three categories, the good, the bad, and the ugly of the 2024 Tennessee Titans. And I want to give them their flowers early because a lot of this show is just going to be me punching down on a really shitty football team. Their defensive and offensive lines are physical. They have very physical trench players. And that sh- it kind of shows in the way that they choose to play. Like they, they run a defense right now where they have three linebackers who are leading in snaps. Chris, there's not a lot of most teams base defenses become nickel, right? And even the ones that play a four, three, like you need to have some really special linebacker talents in order to make that work. The Tennessee Titans don't have that problem. Like they can play their base three, four defense and know that they've got and a lot of it's because of Tavondre Sweat, a player in this draft who I think a lot of people thought because of his d- trouble with the law that he got into that he his draft stock was going to be hurt. And he ended up going in the second round, I believe. Chris, if you want to fact check me on that. Um, but their trench players are really physically imposing and their defensive line is really effective, which is why they kind of quietly like lead their team in terms of a lot of the major metrics and uh, some of the statistics that you look for in quality defensive players, you know, pressure they they've got in terms of just pressures, right? Jeffrey Simmons, Harold Landry, Tavondre sweat between them. They're sharing 25 quarterback pressures and five sacks. It's a pretty good haul. Harold Landry for an edge rusher is playing very good football. He's got four sacks through the first, Six weeks of the season. So he's averaging about two thirds of one a week. Jeffrey Simmons is just a nasty son of a bitch in the middle of the defensive line. And he's always a problem. Just a career long problem. And if Chris, think back to all the Bills games of the past, just over the past couple of years where they beat us on Monday night. And there was always some kind of a fracas between Jeff Simmons and our center, Jeff Simmons and Josh Allen. It was like a, it wasn't quite on the level of Christian Wilkinson, but it was close. You know? Yeah. They're just nasty physical players in the trenches. And I, I mean, that's how you're supposed to play the game of football, right? Allegedly. 
And when they had Derrick Henry, that was what gave their team balance. So that kind of is still like last week, they didn't give up a sack. Um, they, they just done a really good job in terms of a lot of things in the trenches to help their team find some sort of stability. The problem seems to be everything that goes on around that, but we'll get to that in a minute because again, I just one more thing that I do like about this team. Like if I had to say anything, it's that their front seven plays really assignment sound football. They're not world beaters. Chris, they're not superstars. They don't have a lot of guys who, you know, like, um, like here, if I give you names, how many of these guys, Quandry Diggs heard of them. Okay. It's what's funny is Quandry Diggs was released by the Seahawks as a safety signed with Tennessee and he's having a great season. If I were to say, let's say Kenneth Murray Jr. Never heard of him. Of course not. How about Legereus Sneed? Heard of him? Yeah, heard of him. He sucks. <laughs> He's having a really bad season. But they are just very assignment sound in what they do. And so in that way, it does kind of show up when you take a look at the fact that their defense is the number one defense in the NFL against the pass. And they're a top 10 rushing defense. It's pretty impressive when you consider how much time their defense spends on the field. Yeah. yeah. So while they don't have a ton of star power, they are very, very efficient assignment sound, and they're just stiff in the trenches. And that has the bones of what should be a very good football team. If they could ever store any goddamn points. And that brings us to what is not so good. Mayonnaise. Well, we'll get to that in a second. No, 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 no. We'll get to that. Yeah, it's not even time, Chris. We, we There's so much time. Scoring is a major issue for the Tennessee Titans here in 2024. Here's a statistic. Going back to the first game of the 2022 season, the Titans have scored 17 or fewer points in 23 of their 39 games. Over that same period, they averaged less than seven points scored in the seven, second half of football games. That's fairly pathetic, isn't it? Oh, yeah. If you take a look at where they are, like that sounds bad. And that statistically is going back to 2022. In 2024, the Titans have only managed to break the 20 point barrier once. And that was against a Dolphins team sagging so badly. You'd think that they were trying not to be an extra on Golden Girls. Like just Hey, Chris, that was the week after the after Tua just imploded. And then they decided that Skylar Thompson wasn't a good fit. So, hey, I know. Let's put Snoop Huntley out here. Hey, Mark, you hear that? Snoop Huntley. Let's put him in, even though he hasn't had time to learn the playbook. How bad could it be? Yeah. <laughs> And then also, by the way, they had to insert a backup quarterback. I was laughing because I saw a tweet earlier this week that was saying, uh, you know, basically pointing out like, hey, you know, the, the Browns are the only team in the NFL to not have scored 20 points this season. And I had to respond to it and tweet out. I'm like, guys, 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 don't pat yourselves in the back too fucking hard here. Okay, because if it wasn't for the fact that the Dolphins just laid down it's and not even laid down. If you've ever seen the movie uh, Tucker and Dale versus evil, what the Miami Dolphins did, first of all, you had to bench your starting quarterback and put in Mason Rudolph. But also what the Miami Dolphins did by starting a quarterback who didn't know the playbook was essentially run head first into a wood chipper on national TV. You wouldn't have like this would be impossible and you'd be in the same group. So I would pipe down Tennessee Titans. They have a real problem scoring points this season. And that's an issue if you're talking about playing a team like the Buffalo Bills, who. If if you as an offense can't keep our offense off the field, Josh Allen is a very special player who can just seemingly make things happen. One thing that can hold a lot of that back for the Buffalo Bills is our coaching staff, something that we've talked about a lot over the last few weeks in this podcast. Here's what's great, Chris. Their coach, Callahan, might actually be worse than Sean McDermott. In what way? I don't even think it's 
Well, so here's what it is. You want to talk about guys who are just, as the kids say, mid? It's going to be a real rock fight between Sean McDermott and Callahan to figure out which one of them is the worst. Here's what we're talking about. First of all, did you know that the entire coaching staff, okay, the entire coaching staff for Callahan? His dad's on it. Sure. Of course he is. Do you think it would be crazy to hire a def- I'm looking at it right now, a head coach, a defensive coordinator, and an offensive coordinator that have never called plays before? How do you think that That's goes? wild. <laughs> well, he came from Cincinnati. There's there's no way that he called plays for Cincinnati with Zach Taylor there, correct? Exactly. So what you did was you poached a player off of a successful tree who has no... Ex- so you Adam Gase to yourself. But then you said, hey, guess what? If I'm doing it at head coach, why not do it at offensive coordinator? And why not do it at defensive coordinator too? Fuck. It was throw- Guys... We can't, it can't go that poorly, can it? To have a bunch of people who have never called plays at an NFL level before make up your entire leadership of an NFL, of an NFL franchise. It's alarming how the brain trust for the Tennessee Titans came up with this concept. And when you start to dig into some of the finer details, like I spent a lot of time this week over at the Tennessee Titans Reddit page, just reading all about these guys. And I curated a really nice collection of uh, a lot lot of nice collection of posts, some uh, a lot of interesting information. But one of the things that I consistently saw about everybody who was banging on their coach, Chris. Callahan's worst traits appear to be the fact that he's too conservative and makes terrible in-game decisions. <laughs> this is like the ultimate, the unstoppable force meets the immovable object. Yeah. Sean McDermott, Callahan, they're going to come together, mano y mano, and figure out which one of them can make the dumber choice. I love it. I love the dynamic, right? Think about this is a team that decided they didn't need uh, Mike Vrabel anymore. Mike Vrabel took them what? I think he took them to an AFC title game once. Yeah. yeah. Good playoff record. He had a really good playoff record. But they relied all the way on Derrick Henry. Okay. You know what is lost in the sauce here that you didn't bring up? Hmm. Right there on the screen. Colt Colt Anderson. Colt Anderson. He's their special teams coordinator. He was involved in that fake punt play with the Colts and Patriots. (laughs) Yes. He's their special teams coordinator. That's amazing. I love this. So someone here posted uh, after the Indianapolis Colts loss this week. Callahan's either a really bad head coach or was hired way too early or both but he's losing games and some real rookie mistakes. I genuinely think if we just ran Tony Pollard 30 times a game, we would get the most boring win on earth. (laughs) He calls plays like he has no trust in Levis until we're up by four in the fourth quarter with five minutes left. And then he dials up all these passes. (laughs) I think my favorite, you know, before we kind of switch gears and talk about what I think is truly and outrightly sucks about this team. (sighs) The problem is you took you you took a coaching staff with no experience. You gave them the keys to the car in terms of a football team. And then you as a GM kind of saw what was going around in war, at least what you perceived to be happening in the AFC South and said, this might be our time. Let's spend some money. And they went out and picked up a Legereus Sneed and they went and picked up a who's having a terrible season. Like I've got a I've got a tweet here from Brett Coleman, kind of bookmarked. He says, I know the Titans don't get a lot of attention, but we really should talk about how poorly the Legereus acquisition has gone for the Titans so far. He's on pace to have three pass breakups for the entire season. Just to put that into perspective, this is a guy who has played at a like Pro Bowl caliber level every year that he played for Steve Spagnolo in Kansas City. He gets a fat contract. In free agency, part of the two hundred and twenty eight million dollars that the Tennessee Titans spent this year in free agency, all told in the total total contracts. 
Taylor Rapp had three pass breakups in our game this past week against the Jets. Legereus Sneed is on pace to have three of them all season. That's how badly this is going. Also, what, he had 17 pass breakups last year and 26 over the last two seasons. And this isn't a case of nobody targets him. He leads the Tennessee Titans in targets. Legereus Sneed left, and Chris, now is this like a, uh, to, to, to me, when I think about Legereus Sneed being one of the things that stinks alongside this coaching staff for the Tennessee Titans, is this a peerless price situation? Could be. Leger- I, I bet you that the Kansas City Chiefs made a contract offer to Legereus Sneed, and then he said no, and they were like, all right, well, then we're not going to haggle we'll go figure it out because we have a really good defensive coordinator and we have a really good GM. And so he goes and he takes the money and he goes to another franchise who isn't, first of all, doesn't have the same level of talent around him. Doesn't have the same coordinating talent clearly because that guy's never called plays. And also, so Chris, imagine this, you have a defensive coordinator who's learning on the job, how to be a D coordinator. How are you going to help a guy like Legereus Sneed fit into a system he's never played in before? Sounds tough. And he's str- he looks like it. He is struggling incredibly this year when it comes to anything. I mean, he's one of their worst rated defend- defensive players. He's well, what a 22% missed tackle rate, <laughs> which, which is embarrassing for him because he was really good in this way on, just a year ago in Kansas City. In terms of targets, he's leading the team in targets with 21. And while he's only given up nine receptions, it's good for 107 yards. When he gets burned, he gets burned. It's ugly. And you sp- and that's kind of become the narrative. You look at all the places where they spent their money and they're just not getting a good return on investment for any of the free agency dollars they spent. Chris, are you shocked when you figure out that the coaches are still trying to figure out what they do? You work in manufacturing. That I do. Imagine if you went to work and you have a boss. You get put in a new department for the first time. You have a boss who literally just started two days ago, and that guy's supposed to be teaching you how to do your job. I've had that before. How how did it go? (laughs) You You just go... The look on your face. Yeah, you're a fucking idiot. Mm -hmm. And then you drive away. (laughs) You drive away. (laughs) Ah, So, LeJerry Sneed and the rest of these free agent acquisitions. Chris, give it a goog for me. The Tennessee Titans free agency class for 2024. Bad return on investment seems to be the soup du jour. And the problem is, is that it's some of the players who... It's either guys who are currently leading them for snap count or, unfortunately, it's put them in situations where they have no choice but to then go out. Yeah, there you go. Free agency moves. Calvin Ridley. Calvin Ridley, Tony Pollard, Lloyd Cushenberry. Mason Rudolph. Mason Rudolph at quarterback, Sebastian Joseph Day. Is it uh, Cushenberry here? You know, he's like second on the team and third on the team in pressures allowed. That's good. <laughs> it, it's, there's ju- Chidobi Awuze. <laughs> it's just, it's just not good. Guys, they spent a lot of money and I think I get it. They saw what they saw last year in Will Levis and said, hey, We've got a young quarterback on a on a contract who looks like he could take another step if we get him some support. Let's get a new coach in here who's an offensive mind. Because, Chris, that should help, right? Mm-hmm. An offensive mind should help your young quarterback succeed or at least advance in terms of his skill set, his acclimation to a playbook, you know, rather than a defensive-minded guy like Mike Vrabel. You're going to bring this guy in and then, oh, by the way, let's capitalize on this window since the AFC AFC South looks soft and let's spend a ton of cash. And it, none of this is materialized. Your offense stinks. None of your free agent acquisitions are really contributing at a high level. And while you can blame the coach for a lot of it, you know who else needs that, Chris? I wish we had that drop, the Mayo drop. 
<laughs> from what? <laughs> from remember, Mayo? Who the fuck is Mayo? Gotta roll, Mayo. <laughs> Mayo? Who? Who the fuck is Mayo? I'm Mayo. It's my gang name. It's short for mayonnaise <laughs> on, a, on account of my skin color. This guy puts it in his fucking coffee. He should be shot on principle, right? That's, I don't even know if that's good enough. Drawn and quartered by horses. That doesn't like. That doesn't sound good. Mayonnaise in coffee. He has a it, Hellman sponsorship. Is, is there anything that you put in any food that is weird to the the public, the general public? Can you think of anything? I mean, I put condiments on everything, but they're all yeah. standard condiments. It's like mustard, ketchup, relish, blue cheese, hot sauce, mayonnaise. I will say you will put all of that on a salt and vinegar chip and then oh, sure. full hand it into your mouth. Sure. It, that's probably the weirdest thing. Cause you, I've, when I had my uh, apartment in South Buffalo, I do re- remember day or I'd have a bag of chips open and you'd roll in. <laughs> Oh, here's a chip. Let me put on some Mighty Taco sauce, Lloyd Rocket sauce, mustard, mayonnaise, ketchup, and then sriracha. I see nothing wrong with this. <laughs> I'm a man who likes to experiment with flavor, Chris. I am the I am Captain Jean-Luc Picard. Right? I'm out there just exploring the galaxy of flavors, just trying to find new combinations and bring I feel like sometimes I discover things and like like Prometheus bringing fire to humans, uh, just you savages. I'm out here trying to bring flavors to you, and none of you are willing to understand that. Tweet at us at Rockpile Report <laughs> with your weird food combinations that you do, or comment down below on uh, YouTube. If I see anything I like, I might try it. I'll try it here right on the air. Will Levis is a problem. Now, first of all, you those of you who have a pulse and have been on the internet – He's on a generational run of every week doing something else that just makes him look like a moron. The first week, it was a game, like a game costing interception return for a touchdown that he had no business throwing. And they said he did a failure Cobra, Chris, which is like he's on his knees, but you don't just like watch the play happen. Like, have you ever seen Tom Brady throw a pick six and he just goes, ah, damn it. Here's Will Levis on his knees doing this. Oh, no. It's like, no, don't do that. That makes you look so much more hilarious. (laughs) You can't do that. What was wild about that game against the Bears is the Bears won without having an offensive touchdown. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good one. Yeah, the generational meme run for Will Levis continues. Guys, Google it right now. Generational meme run. That look. Then there's him like flying through the air, but still lofting a ball away for no reason whatsoever. And that also got intercepted. Um, There's him getting pancaked by an offensive lineman. There's him. Fourth and two. There's him. This pat just this past weekend, the double whammy. The team is doing a touchdown celebration for Noah Westbrook Kenny's touchdown pass. I think it was their only touchdown pass of the game. And the team is doing like a like a group celebration. And out of nowhere, Will Levis comes running in and starts pretending that he's shooting webs like he's Spider-Man. <laughs> like he's that kid, Chris. You ever every kid you, you grew up with one of these kids who just never because nobody liked him, never really knew what was going on, but just immediately inserted himself into the middle of it like like a bull in a china shop. It's because he wanted to belong for a minute and try to be cool. You just describing me? No, because you don't have the outgoingness for that. No, I I I can get there. <laughs> it sounds like you described me. Yeah. So this is Will Levis. He's a whole, and then and then later in the game he barrel rolled into a like kid working the sideline and tore his ACL and didn't check on the kid. Like didn't even bother asking him if he was okay. Will Levis is a horse's ass. And when you look at his passing chart, Chris, if you want to throw this up here and post for the guys, I want to show you guys something that I think is bizarre. When you talk about NFL passer rating in certain positions and where you target the field, Will Levis's line has done a pretty good job, a pretty good job of protecting him. Yeah, I I think that they've done a pretty good job of helping keep him clean 
in the real in scenarios, I mean, he's he, the problem is that now you don't have to pressure him. Will Levis has been hit so many times he's getting happy feet. And you're getting this sense of like JP Lossman almost. Because you see the physical tools of Will Levis and say, hey, I don't understand why he fell to the second round. Okay, he fell to the second round. Now he's a Titan. Now he's here and he's starting and he looks like he's got some moxie. He's got a zippy arm. He's got all kinds of things that he can do for you. And now you're seeing what happens when you spend too much time playing on a shitty team and it, you're probably getting conflicting information and you're dealing with a coaching staff that's probably in over its head. When you look at his passer chart, it is bizarre to me that when he's not blitzed compared to when you blitz him, his yards per attempt are just about the same. That's not good, is it? No. He's thrown almost as many interceptions when they keep him clean in the pocket as he has when he's under pressure. That's not great. <laughs> what you do notice, though, is that he's thrown four touchdown passes this season when you keep him clean and upright. If you even simulate pressure, he has one touchdown pass to three interceptions. And when you look at the areas of the field where he's succeeding and where he's doing poorly, some of it boggles the mind. Chris, zero to 10 yards. That's usually where you as a quarterback are looking for a check down. Correct. Like, hey, we called an intermediate route and it didn't work. On check down passes, <laughs> Will Levis has thrown three touchdowns and three interceptions. <laughs> How are you throwing that many interceptions just off the line of scrimmage? That doesn't make it, it defies logic. Other than. You get happy feet in the pocket. The defense knows this and they bait you into leaving and then they just shift with you. And then as you're rolling, you're trying to force a play and it turns into an interception. It's ugly. When he, th Chris, if he's throwing to his right or to his left, under 10 yards, his NFL passer rating is less than 68. That's awful. That's awful. And then what gets funnier is that he's actually more productive when he throws to 10 to 20, like in that intermediate window, which almost makes sense because that's where, if you think about the makeup of the wide receiver room, like that was supposed to be the reason that this was an imposing football team was this wide receiver room, which we're about to talk about. The wide receiver room was supposed to be what helped Levis take that next step and the offensive minded head coach and all the other things that they supposedly built this team around. And instead, what you have is a group of guys who do a really good job of working the intermediate areas. But when they try to work the deep parts of the field, Will Levis has no ability to throw to them. Do you know that beyond 20 yards when throwing to his left, he has a 3.5 passer rating single digits 3.5 he's thrown two interceptions and has 23 yards on seven attempts most likely because he's being forced to roll out to the left now a good coach will build in safety valves into his offense to prevent that sort of thing from happening but callahan doesn't seem to understand that and so now what you have is a quarterback who doesn't understand what's being asked of him can't execute this new offense. It's not being watered down for him, and nobody can understand why it's so broken. They legitimately thought that having the wide receivers would fix everything. Who does that remind you of? I have no idea. A lot of teams. Th think about teams in the, that we play often that thought, well, let's get wide receivers. That'll fix all my problems. Sounds like the Jets. <laughs> Guys, just more wide receivers. The offensive line, I don't need that. Sounds like the Dolphins, sounds like the Jets. It's just like a bunch of other teams that also right now suck. Wouldn't you agree? Yep. And the one of the bigger problems, when you want to talk about the dysfunction that's happening, here's a legitimate quote, like a legitimate quote from the quarterback. You talk about, or not, or not from the quarterback, from the head coach, Callahan of the Tennessee Titans. He was asked in an interview after the uh, after the loss to Indy, wouldn't it be more in line to letting Will cut it loose more than playing it safe? 
Callahan's response was, there are calls that call for the ball to go down the field. And the ball doesn't go down the field. (laughs) Your coach is literally blaming your quarterback now for his play calling not landing. It Makes sounds sense. like everything's going well there, doesn't it? Yeah, they're going to have to move off Levis. It, I mean, it is telling that Mason Rudolph's the only quarterback to score more than 20 points for them. Part of that is because there is no chemistry being built either with the scheme or with the players. You know, this past week, it, there was a lot made about the eight targets for Kelvin Ridley without a reception. And Chris, which we have some audio from him in the post game talking about his involvement and how upset he is with this. They wanted to kind of make getting you targets and and part of this offense a priority today and to kind of not have it result in any catches. I guess what was kind of off that resulted in targets but no catches? I had targets in uh, what part of the game I had targets? Fourth quarter, a lot of them. All right, then. So, shit, I need some in the beginning of the fucking game, too, then. Like, shit's getting fucking crazy for me. So, I'm just, you know, it is what it is. You, I, I, I suck today. I got to be better. But I got to get the ball a little early in the game so I can be in the game and here with the team so I can play well also. Did you expect to get targets early? Just kind of I don't know. We just, you know, we're trying to win the game. Chris, there is a compilation right now on Twitter. If you go out there, and you take a look at the eight targets, and I put those in air quotes for those of you not watching it, the targets that Kelvin Ridley received, it's a travesty. His eight targets were either wildly off target, thrown to him when he was double covered and had no hope of making a play. One of them actually resulted in an interception. Or they were act, they, they were legitimate hospital balls that in the act of catching them, he was hit and they were knocked away from him. This is your big free agent acquisition at wide receiver. And yet neither quarterback nor offensive coordinator can seem to find a way to get this guy any sort of chemistry in this offense. That's alarming, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And now you're hearing it in his voice. The frustration of a player who signed up for something he didn't fully understand. Just like every Titans fan. Just like I'm sure if you ask the owners, right? If you ask, uh, I think it's Kay Adams. <clears throat> but Adam's daughter. Kay Adams is a host on FanDuel. Okay, that's why. I did. So his daughter, I think his daughter owns the team, but whoever does, all of this, like everybody here, there's no understanding from one person to the next. They, they have no chemistry. And this stacked wide receiver core that was supposed to make them great, Chris, you you were supposed to have Kelvin Ridley with DeAndre Hopkins and Tyler Boyd, and they were going to be great together. Amy Adams. Amy Adams. I was close. Slappy, sappy, Samsonite. Oh, oh, I was way off. Yeah, you were way off. On its face, the upshot for this offense was that they'd build off last year, get some wide receivers who would come in and dominate passing targets. They would add Tony Pollard to Tajay, Tajay Spears. And they'd be this super balanced juggernaut on offense that could protect Will Levis while also letting him expand his repertoire as a passer. (sighs) Over the course of the first month and a half of the season, they've only got one win. So something clearly went wrong. I don't know what the scheme is. That's how broken this thing is. But I can tell you that the the talents that you brought in might not have been the best. Chris, when you think, think, think about this. DeAndre Hopkins right now is 110th in the NFL among all qualifying wide receivers in terms of yards after the catch over ex- expectation. It's one of my favorite analytics. Those electric plays that he used to make are gone. He no longer is getting catches in positions where he can break tackles and run away from people. But also, you're seeing him go down at first contact pretty regularly. All of his statistics are career lows. His catch and target numbers are absolutely fucked. I mean, 2022, he had seven double-digit target games and nine appearances for the Cardinals. It was his last year there. 2023, he goes in and gets double-digit targets in six of his 18 games, and he led the team in targets for the year. This year, he has no games with seven targets or more, and no games with more than 70 yards. 
DeAndre Hopkins might be the only thing that's proven on your entire offense, and you found a way to neuter him by scheme. You've intentionally neutered your best piece, which is just another shot at the coach and shot at the coaching staff that helps you understand they have all this potential. It just doesn't sound like they have the ability to put any of it together. Also, you have to qualify for at least 15 targets for next-gen stats to keep your records. Tennessee only has the three guys I just talked about who have 15 targets or more in the NFL season. That's a problem. You're trying to funnel your entire passing attack through six weeks through the same three guys. And oh, by the way, like if you want to talk about average separation, people bag all over the Buffalo Bills. The team is led by Hopkins at 48th in the NFL. Boyd slots in at 59th and Kelvin Ridley is 102nd because he's being double covered and neither one of the other guys can. Chris, at this point, those guys don't just stop being quality NFL players. It has to be driven by the scheme, doesn't it? Scheme yeah. and quarterback. Yeah, scheme matters. How does Will Levis stop being a functional quarterback in the NFL? How does DeAndre Hopkins stop mattering in terms of, the, in terms of NFL production? How does Kelvin Ridley get eight targets, quote unquote, and not get a single catch? I don't know. I hope he took the under on himself. At this point, I would start gambling. Dude, think about it. Maybe that's the way out of this. You gamble, get suspended for the year, and now you don't have to worry about any of this. And until they catch you, you could be shaving point. You could be taking the under on your own prop bets. Yeah. <laughs> the reality is their offense, when it's working, flows directly through the running back room. And without Tajay Spears for this game, it's going to be very hard for them to generate offense. You know, I, I, Tony Pollard, his most productive game of the year came last week when he saw nothing but light boxes. Otherwise, every other week where his production has been fair, you know, 70, 70 ish yards. And I, I don't exactly know. I can take a look at his game logs, but essentially no one has stacked the box again. Like, stack the box against other running backs. But when they do stack the box against him, his production just dries up and disappears. So in that way, I just, I don't know, Chris, do you, after everything I've just explained to you about how broken they are, how much hope does it give you that they're actually going to present a problem for the Buffalo Bills on Sunday? Bill should handle them. And if they don't, we're going to have problems. If they don't, I'm going to lay on the ground out in the parking lot. Like I'm going to leave early and I'm going to go lay face down in a puddle in the parking lot and try to drown. Yeah. Like if you look at this, he's got three rushing touchdowns in the season. Indy at Miami week one at Chicago. Those are his most productive games. And if you look at the box numbers for them, every single one of them were games where teams didn't put eight in the box more often. I think that they're in for like the Bills have the ability to play the run like there's eight in the box because of Teron Johnson's just tackling in tenacity. And I think that presents a real problem for the Titans this weekend in terms of how they match up with us. And that brings us to this week's keys to victory. Wow, it's a lot of keys. <clears throat> Bigger the keychain, more powerful the man. I'll keep it short and sweet. One of the keys to victory is that you have to manage the rushing attack. And I think Teron Johnson coming back, like we saw it last night, he is ready. Yeah, he made He's some great it. plays last night. He made night. some amazing plays. And that's going to be huge. His presence alone is going to be huge for this. His play on Sunday is going to be huge because we're going to play a lot of nickel just because we don't want him to try to think they can get cute and bait us into some kind of a base look and then use their wide receivers. We're going to play a ton of nickel. Might, might even see some dime with Ingram. In fact, I'd support it given the the way their wide receiver charts drawn up and how they use them. I think that they're mostly going to find themselves facing an offense that loves to run. I mean, they, they, they're up near the top of the league in terms of running plays on first down, which I think at this point in Chris, at this point in time, we've all established that that's not how you win in the NFL, right? Yeah. The old school run, run pass doesn't work now. 
I think that having Teron Johnson man back in the roster is going to be a giant key in the way he plays because his ability to corral down running plays when they go to base, you know, to when they go to 12 personnel looks. I still want to be able to play them using our nickels so that we A, don't have to bring guys in and out, but also B, they don't get any bright ideas about trying for play action stuff. And I think we can use that a heavy dose of nickel and dime to just smother any hope of mustering a passing attack they might have. I mean, the Bills have done a very nice job covering teams through the air. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know how you want to take, like, I also think pre-snap motion is going to be huge, right? Yeah, yeah. Pre-snap motion is going to be important because Will Levis, like we said, he's volatile. His passer ratings are all over the place. His accuracy is kind of suspect, but he's got it in his head that he can take these shots, and he's got it in his head that he's physically capable of making certain throws. And at the same time, when you speed him up, he gets scrambly. So by changing the picture defensively pre-snap versus post-snap, I think it's going to do, you know, the fact that we were able to suppress the passing game of the Texans, I don't think that this is going to be some Herculean task. And I think that if we can get a lead early, we're going to be able to make them a one-dimensional team that can't survive via the run. Yeah, because that's been how they've gotten into most of their games, or at least stayed in them until late right up until they fall apart. It's generally speaking been a you know heavy dose of run, conservative passing game. And then when they ask them to, <laughs> when they have a lead and the game gets late, they try to open things up and they say, okay, surprise, we're going to shock them with the passing attack and it all falls apart. I think if we can take an early lead, that's going to be imp- like, that's going to undo them right there. And so for the bills, the offensive key for us winning this game, is going to be picking on the linebacker core and Legere's Sneed. You have to find ways to get after him. Now, <clears throat> what's interesting is that Legere's Sneed, for all of his inability to not get after the ball in the air, you think about cornerbacks historically for the Buffalo Bills. You know, Trey White. Trey White wasn't you know getting interceptions when he was in college. And part of it was, hey, well, you can't really attack the ball in the air when you're not comfortable in the scheme. But if you can get comfortable in the scheme or the coach can make it comfortable for you, then you get guys who are just reacting rather than thinking. And that usually leads to more turnovers. It leads to more pass breakups. It leads to guys being more aggressive attacking the ball in the air because they're not thinking about where the man is. They're tracking their man just kind of instinctively, and then they can make plays. I think that the Titans are going to have a really hard time with this iteration of the Bills offense because even without a number one receiver, I don't think Amari Cooper will play. And if he does, I don't expect him to see a heavy workload. Who knows? Maybe I eat crow on this. I think the thing that you have to do is hit them in the linebacker core with a healthy dose of running back and tight end who not for nothing are still the most efficient pass catchers on this team. And then see when you can get your matchup. I mean, the matchup I like the most is Khalil Shakir on literally anybody. But I don't know that he's healthy. Like, he didn't look great. No, I don't remember him getting a lot of targets. <laughs> he had decent separation numbers, but those can sometimes, you know, going back and rewatching the tape, some of it's because the play had already drifted away or the Jets defense knew that they had already forced Allen off his first or second target. And they kind of dropped down and would kind of let him drift realistically who's your best weapon against these guys if it's not james cook and it's not ray davis and it's not dalton kincaid who are you looking at to go up against legerious need and expecting them to win more often than they lose shakir it's probably shakir and so in that way it'll be interesting to see how they choose to one how they choose to deploy amari cooper what you know maybe it's just in the red zone maybe it's a handful of snaps maybe they don't even make him active i would give him a small chance to play because let's remember we're recording this on tuesday trade happened today tuesday's an off day they start the install tomorrow for the titans so if he can get a small package of plays where yep he can learn the playbook and the terminology within it and then you have a couple days for him to get acclimated with josh allen getting chemistry down 
I'd say small chance he plays. I don't I don't know. But he's coming in the day of the install for the Titans game. I think that this is going to be a tough game for the Titans. We put too much ball pressure on. <clears throat> I think this is a game where we can put scoreboard pressure on our opponent for the first time in a long time. Don't you? Yeah. Like the last couple of weeks, it's been one of those things of just hang on for dear life. I don't see how this team coached, even though we don't love Sean McDermott, their team seems like much more of a, what's, what's the old 90s wrestling term, slap nuts? Oh, yeah, Jeff Jarrett, <laughs> slap nuts. He, they all just seem rudderless. And in that way, I'm not threatened by them schematically. I think that if his in-game coaching is suspect, then that kind of equalizes Sean McDermott's gaffes. And so then if you're just trying to talk about skill versus skill, I don't know how you can try to put Will Levis out dueling Josh Allen. Like, that's not a reality. I think that the reality is for us, we have to get scores early, which sounds like that sounds like an idiot's take. But realistically, we have the opportunity to do it. I think you can lean on the run. You can bleed a lot of clock early. And if you can get those running backs involved in the passing attack against those linebackers, it's going to be really hard for them to find an answer on the other side of the ball. Do we go back to uh start of the season where we got aggressive opening drive, mm-hmm. keep that going, go for it on uh fourth down? I see a very aggressive approach early in this game just to try to put it out of reach fast. I think if the Bills come out and do that and they don't pussyfoot around about this, I think this game's pretty simple, right? Oh, yeah. It better be. Otherwise, I'm going to have a lot of choice words and a lot of other people are going to be really upset with me. (laughs) A lot of people in the stands around me are going to be really upset if this thing's like a 14 point game going into the fourth quarter, like 14 all furious. And also Tyler Bass is going to have to like, Chris, is this his last gasp? Dude, it doesn't sound like we brought in. It doesn't sound so we didn't bring in anyone for workouts today. That's alarming. So this is the Tyler Bass game. You have this game. Another game with multiple misses. Chris, what do we do? It seems like he's becoming Blair Walsh. Yes. Is what's happening. Yes. If he continues to miss mid-range kicks in that 30 to 45 yard range, you got to bring somebody in and get a look. So one of the other keys is going to be Tyler Bass just getting his head screwed on right, getting his mechanics in order this week. And you got to bring your A game, man. Because I could also see this being a game where our offense just stalls in the red zone. And we're going to have to rely on a group of field goals in order to put that scoreboard pressure on the Titans the way we need to. Need Bass dialed in. Can't have him missing 47-yard field goals and then giving them shorter fields to work with. Can't do it. So. I'm excited. I'm almost more excited for the tailgate than the game. 4180 Abbott Road. I got a bunch of leftover cocktails from the last home game. Those are coming with me. Uh, Because hockey season has now started, we're going to have the Toronto cocktail on hand. That is uh, Canadian rye whiskey. I got a Alberta premium cask strength. And uh, that's uh, the Toronto cocktail is... Two ounces of rye whiskey, quarter ounce of Fernet Branca for a little bit of bit- bitterness, and then a quarter ounce of simple syrup to round out the flavors in the rye and the Fernet Branca. It's one of my top cocktails. Going to have that. I don't know what I'm doing for Old Fashions this week, what what style I'm doing, but uh, we'll have Old Fashions. I think I got a bottle of Green River Full Proof over there in the uh, other room that I'll bring. Uh, I don't know what I'll do with that. Probably a different style, old fashioned. Because what I've learned from the first two games is anybody that shows up to the tailgates coming for an old fashioned, not so much of a improved cocktail or a black Manhattan or a regular Manhattan. Maybe if your dad comes, I'll make a Manhattan. <laughs> Can we get old Dave Gear out to the tailgate? Maybe. I'll have to give him a call. But it's funny, Chris, because as we're sitting here and we're trying to wrap this, All the punching down I've done in the Titans. Final thoughts. I'll just leave you with what their own fan base has to say, Chris. You don't believe me that this is a problem and that you should feel very confident if you're a Bills fan ahead of this one. 
Why don't you just listen to to, to the explanation of Titans fans themselves uh, from Night Pain sixty nine? All these all, all of these from, are from Reddit. Fuck you, ten year old me for choosing to be a fan of this team. <laughs> uh, Mister Barnacles says, "Demolish the stadium, and then don't worry about a new one." <laughs> And here was one of my favorites. Consider that this team is one in four against Caleb Williams in his first game. 40 year old Aaron Rodgers and the fired Robert Sala. Malik Willis, the quarterback we traded away. Tyler Huntley and Joe Flacco. It's a horrific start. Way worse than one in four looks on paper. Chris, that should make everybody feel pretty good about this, shouldn't it? Oh, yeah. Guys, in their words, don't even need to hear it from me. Hopefully this one's a slam dunk or at least it's as easy as it feels like it should be. See, I'm, but I don't know. we'll see how it all goes and I'll see you on the other side. I'm Drew Gear. That's Chris Krueger. And this has been your week seven preview.